Dear friends, this is the end of the first day of Gaidar Forum 2022. For the whole year, we had expert opinions. Colleagues were talking about economy, governance, leadership, and there were lots of and lots of expert opinions, lots of results of research. Quite a lot of uh, practical examples, but now we are going to see more practical uh, cases. And for the third time, in the framework of the Gaidar Forum, we'll have the special session which we uh, call a word to the leader. It was first invented three years ago when we wanted to give the floor to winners of the Leaders of Russia competition. We wanted to see how they think, and the experience was very successful. We are doing it online now, but still, you're going to hear opinions of leaders from the whole country. Right now, here, you will hear plans and ideas of those who are winners of Leaders of Russia contents. They are going to talk about themselves, they are going to talk about their future, uh, future of the country, and some factors of the success in the future. What is leadership? They are also going to talk about that. We will start with Armen Pogosyan. He is the head of the Nest Construction Company. This is aggregator Hampiru. He has a big family, and he is into triathlon. Armen, let's talk to you. Uh, dear Larissa, dear unemployed people, I wanted to start like that because I'm going to talk about demographic challenges in the conditions of the global automation and digitalization. But I will start with something else. I think there are such people as lawyers, accountants, economists, teachers, shop assistants, and mm, lots of us are parents as well. A lot of us work in the spheres that I mentioned. Let's still think, let's remember that these professions are those which have the, the biggest number of people, and these professions will be automated in the future, uh, same as uh, cleaners, security guards and other assistants in different industries. We are moving towards the post-industrial society. That's like the meeting of tectonic platforms. Uh, there will be the change of the landscape, seismic blows and migration of the population. McKinsey said that by 2030, uh, from 3 to 14 percent of those working will uh, have to change the profession or they will uh, be left unemployed. It's up to 700 million people in just 10, 15 years. Moreover, our friends from Ron Hicks identified that if this profession that I mentioned will be automated, uh, this will be 49.3% of the population, people who will be left unemployed. I don't want to give you too much drama. Future is not coming overnight, but it will come quite quickly. Remember when we were riding horses, not so long ago, we were writing letters recently. Now we are all using just messengers. We continued. Uh, we were going to school, but now we only attend webinars. All the shifts were not changing very quickly, but after they happened, we can't continue living in the old paradigm. We have new factories, requirements for um, different types of equipment, uh, requirements for uh, ma manual labor is still there, but do we have horses? Uh, the horses' uh, labor was automated, and now they just used for unemployment or in, uh, for entertainment in parks or in circuses. And elite horses, especially uh, horses, they, have, they cost millions. Of course, it's maybe like a joke, and we will find some new jobs later on, but it will be better if we all 
start thinking about right now, when while we have still a lot of time. It's better if we start creating the basis for this smooth migration. Maybe there will be labor migration, there will be some minimum uh, salary for those who will be left almost unemployed. Or maybe we'll create the structure which will help us to so all this tectonic platform so that this shift will be more gradual. Working population uh, is in danger and maybe these people will never be able to change the profession in the future. Let's start preparing right now uh, for this future which is creeping on us. Armen, thank you very much. Where will we work in the future? There is one idea, maybe we will all will be in tourism, because everything is doing great. Dmitry Afenagenov, chairman of uh, the Association of Entertainment, he told us about what's happening in Sochi. We had no doubts about that. Okay, Dmitry, how are you? Larissa, thank you very much. I welcome all the audience of the Gaida Forum. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, we had 300,000 people visiting Sochi, so this was a really hot time for us, this long Russian holidays. It was a great challenge for us, but we managed to cope with that once again. Now, uh, it's Actually, there were skeptics who didn't think that Sochi has the great potential. Sochi uh, was created due to the Olympic Games and infrastructure was created. That's something absolutely amazing. And now it's a very popular destination. Uh, it doesn't matter that there were skeptical uh, people. Yeah, there are similar examples of uh, resorts, uh, Olympic capitals. So they were not so successful. Some specialists were coming uh, to visit Sochi, trying to understand why we were successful. So I'll tell you our success story. After this international event, such as the Olympic Games, we had to focus on international tourists. And it was great that we started working with Israel. And in 2017, we started just one flight. And in 2019, we now have 16 flights per week, 150,000 of guests in 2019. 70,000 guests uh, stayed at Krasna Poliana, and more than 50,000 were visiting uh, some facilities in Sochi. So we had some statistics, and uh, Russians can spend in casino 100 rubles on average, but uh, an Israeli person can spend uh, 10, 15 dollars on average, so that's 10 times more, actually. That's why Israelis like visiting casinos in Sochi. Indian people or Chinese, uh, they can't spend so much, so that's why we also started uh, working with um, Dubai and Arab Emirates and Indian tourists, and we continue developing the number of flights from these countries. 30% of foreign guests that we had before the pandemic, they turned into a zero. So without the pandemic, we would have had in 2020 50 to 50, so 50% would have been Russians and 50% would have been foreigners. But uh, due to the pandemic, we had more Russian citizens, those who used to go abroad. And they tested Sochi. More than 70% of guests, they came back. They liked Sochi. Why did we achieve that? What was the fact of success? I would say that primarily that's the team. Our team, they are people from different regions of Russia. They came during the Olympic Games. Uh, they came for the World Championship. But they are really interested in seeing tourists coming back. And they are ready to give their smiles, their hospitality to people who come to visit us. Of course, smile is very important. If you smile, that's a very a uh, successful life hack. So the team was a very important brick uh, in the foundation. So that's the team and the infrastructure, they are two important elements that should be linked together. 
наших профессионалов. Что сегодня игорная зона из себя представляет? So, what's this casino zone right now? That's an absolutely cool facility. You can hold their uh, large-scale conferences, business events, and in February you'll see some of the refer activities they, they will uh, be happening there. We are going forward. We're going to the regions. We want to develop our services in Kaliningrad and Vladivostok. We want our country to be more hospitable. Because that's very important. We need to make sure that foreign capital, foreign money is spent in Russia. We want to see inflow of foreign tourists. We are waiting for the opening of borders. We are not afraid to lose our guests. We know that our guests, uh, Russians, they know that's uh, 10 times cheaper, that's very high level of uh, service, great organizational level, and it's possible to organize different level of events here. And I want every one of you to understand that Sochi, that's uh, the destination uh, which makes our planet go around. And what can we say about Orenburg? Svetlana Bukareva, um, who is representing Orenburg. She is the deputy head of the representative office of the Orenburg region. Oh, great geography today. And now we are going to visit the Orenburg region. Could you please uh, put up my slides? Dear colleagues, is it on? Yes, you can uh, move on. So, Orenburg region. Maybe you read something about this region. Uh, if so, you know that it's uh, bordering five or economically developed regions of Russia. In the radius of 1,000 uh, kilometers, there is 58 million people living there. What are the main drivers of the economy? Agricultural complex, uh, oil and gas complex, and mining complex. Uh, we take the third place by the we take the seventh place by the amount of cattle. Uh, so we have 920 precious uh, resources which are mined there. We export to Asia, and uh, our region is uh, a part of the Silk Route. Uh, that's why it's very important uh, from the trade point of view. If you ever visited Orenburg region, you probably know that uh, you can reach us uh, by a comfortable two-level train from Moscow to St. Petersburg, or you can take a plane. So, if you ever visited Orenburg, you probably have seen the historic center of uh, Orenburg, or you visited the governor's Orenburg museum, where you probably listened to lectures about uh, our unique gold, and probably you tasted our delicacies, the mushroom soup uh, in uh, Orenburg style, or fish in sour cream. Or maybe you visited the National Park, uh, which is a village under an open air with uh, 10 reconstructed old houses. And there, there are restaurants that offer meals from different cuisines, the Ukrainian one, the Uzbek one, and so on. And uh, do you know that uh, there is a place where in Orenburg you can try a flight uh, on a hot air balloon? And also we are a producer of uh, gas that is used for balloons. Then there are famous Orenburg kerchiefs or the famous Orenburg 
Valinki made of wool. They are especially popular with the visitors from the U.S. and Canada. The geography of uh, tourists who are coming to Orenburg is growing every year. 406 exporters uh, from Orenburg supply their products to 76 countries across the world. If you've never visited Orenburg region, you probably still heard about Sol Iletsk lakes. Probably you heard about uh, the steppe Echo Park, Chantau. There is a ski resort, Kuvandik. And of course, there is uh, the Buzuluk Pinery, the Pearl of. Uh, our Orenburg nature. Orenburg has not found uh, its identity at once. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were three times that a city with this name was established. Yemelian Pugachev um, actually took this city under a siege for six months. You probably read that in one of Pushkin's books. Over 400 companies with foreign capital operate in Orenburg. So what attracts all those investors? In fact, we have a lot to offer, like transport accessibility, fast logistics, quick access to the EAS market, EAU market. I'll repeat the quick access to the EAU market and benefits that we are very willing to share, as well as our human resources. In Orenburg, we have two special economic zo zones with zero tax rates and zero customs duties. We want our talented and professional young people to study in our region and to continue living and working in our region. That is why we implement various investment projects. We invest and develop the wind energy and conquering the wind with the wind is indeed a very ambitious goal, but it can be solved because Orenburg indeed uh, is the capital of the, renewab the renewables, uh, the capital of Russian solar energy. The overall amount of electricity generated is 6.5 uh, gigawatts. We also invest into developing the distribution center that will be a huge support not only to our local uh, farmers, it will become a logistics hub between the Central Asian countries and Central Russia. We are also investing into building a resort in Sol Iletsk. Everyone knows uh, about Sol Iletsk resorts and lakes. The salty lakes of Sol Iletska famous for giving huge health benefits to those who come here to enjoy the hot step air. In between taking a bath in those lakes, you can uh, take a minute to learn more about local cultures, culture and traditions and to try local watermelons and melons. If you heard something about Orenburg region or you visited it, uh, please do come again. You will be, supply, uh, you will be uh, happily surprised and uh, you will rediscover the region. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Now we want to come to Orenburg as well. And now it's over to Vladimir Kotin. Vladimir Kotov is the president of Association of Developers, Manufacturers and Suppliers of Personal Protective Equipment. Vladimir, it's over to you. Please switch your mic on. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. We can hear and see you very well. Wonderful. Colleagues, good afternoon. And uh, on this eve of the old new year, I would like to 
congratulate you and wish you a Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. Have you actually counted how many good wishes you received over the last week and how many wishes you offered yourself? And just imagine if 12, 20% of all the wishes uh, that I received uh, will come through, I'll be happy and healthy for the next 300 years. Even though we're living in a fastly changing world, the world where uh, we have lots of risks and threats, both at home, at uh, your workplace, when you're going for sport or taking a minute of your leisure time. Um, indeed, it is so, and the world is changing, but uh, for the majority of us, independently of our mindset or religions, uh, we all share the basic human values. We want to be healthy and we want to be happy. We want our dear and near people want to be happy and healthy as well. It happened so that um, my dad died in an accident when I was two years old and my brother was one month old. I grew up in a workers' uh, township where people were getting, uh, were aging quickly and they were dying because of uh, respiratory diseases. Uh, and then there was uh, the Chernobyl disaster. I entered into Methi University to prevent such disasters uh, and accidents from happening again. And then, once visiting one of the regions, I saw retired people that were healthy and happy. And then I told myself that what actually prevents us from living 100 years and uh, making our dreams come true? Probably you know this phrase that uh, if the young would know and if uh, the old would be able to do that, that's sort of a good wish uh, that uh, we repeat often in Russia. Indeed, uh, that that's a contradictory phrase, but uh, how can we actually make it happen in our country? Do you know that uh, we have approximately 12 million people in our country um, who have disabilities out of 140 millions of population? Traumatism and uh, professional and occupational diseases impose restrictions on lives of people and uh, that makes them being a burden on the population of our country and uh, it destroys people's lives. In Russia, it becomes a huge obstacle preventing people from making their dreams come true. That is why we need to have uh, health uh, we need to have uh, occupational health standard. We need to have uh, a good safety culture that lays a basis for protecting people's health. It makes people being responsible for their lives, for their home, and for their country. And of course, here we cannot uh, do without asking traditional questions uh, who is uh, to blame and what to do. But in fact, uh, the majority of people simply lack knowledge about uh, existing risks, about how we can identify them and how we can respond to those risks in an adequate way. That's important to do it in an adequate way. We've all witnessed the pandemic, and there we saw that um, very often threats were being exaggerated or sometimes, for example, risks were not being assessed in a proper way and uh, people did not know consequences of those risks. One is obvious. All that resulted in the turbulence and uh, all that changed the traditional way of people's lives. So right now we need uh, not only to respond uh, to the question what to do. We need to actually start doing something in every moment of our lives in a systematic way. I see two ways out of the situation that we find ourselves in. First of all is health, it's healthy lifestyle and here I support Vladimir Komisarov and then uh, there is a suggestion that was developed by us. We suggest introducing the safety culture. Uh, of course, uh, it's a long way. It's like uh, Moses leading their, uh, his people uh, in the desert and uh, finally fighting the exit. So that's what we need to take up. 
We've established and we've been developing for several years uh, this system of safety. The acronym is BIOT. It encompasses a whole number of events, uh, different contests, Olympiads, workshops uh, that are held uh, with the involvement of safety experts uh, where people can exchange different um, best practices and uh, experiences uh, in, in terms of safety. All these uh, events uh, are focusing and are aimed at, at improving the overall safety environment. We organize regular events in order to implement uh, the safety culture um, covering uh, all age groups and all occupations uh, from kindergartens up to the um, up to retired people. Please feel free to join our association and, uh, of course, uh, we will find a good use to your knowledge and your professional experience. Together we can establish the safety culture in Russia, giving a chance to our children and our great children to live a healthy and safe life. Together we can make our country and the world better. Thank you very much for having me here. I will be glad to take your questions and I will try to do my best to be of use to you. And of course, I wish all of uh, the wishes that you received over the last couple of weeks come true. Live 300 years, and you can find my contacts on the slide. Thank you very much, Vladimir. And now it's over to Vasily Grinchenko. He's uh, an engineer, economist, mathematician, a graduate of Scotland Technical University, and he also is a holder of uh, a degree in Russia. This geologist discovered five, uh, five oil fields uh, in Yakutia, and uh, this is about one and the same person, Vasily. He's the director for large projects management from Irkutsk Oil Company. Larissa, thank you very much. Very often we can hear that there is a big crisis in the oil and gas industry and very soon we won't need oil anymore. I've made my own research and I try to answer three questions. What if crisis? Will we need oil? And do we need plan B? To answer this first question, let's uh, plot the graph of the oil cost. So you see local minimums, and each local minimum uh, was accompanied by a crisis. 2008, 1998, 2008, 2020, 2015, and now we are not in the local minimum anymore. But we live in Russia. Let's plot the same graph in rubles. And uh, after doing that, we see interesting trends. Uh, the trend is going upwards, and now we have the highest price of oil in rubles. Historically, and it doesn't look like there is the crisis in the oil and gas industry. Is it a good thing? It, of course, it's a good thing. The structure of the budget of Russia, 50%, that's oil and gas profits. It means that this industry influences each of us. And I could give you the following metaphor. Oil and gas industry, that's a very good meat cow, which also gives milk. It's happy and it gives milk to everyone. But if we look at the situation wider, we would see that this cow is standing near the cliff. And we can prove that by doing very simple calculation. This is a graph of oil production for a classic oil field. In each oil and gas textbook, you will see such an example. So we start with drilling. We produce more and more oil, then we have the project level, and we stabilize the production level. And after that, the production drops. Usually, that's due to the depletion of resources. Uh, why, if this graph is classic, the production is not going down on the scale of the country? 
The answer is the investment. We need to start using new oil fields. In five, ten years before, we need to ensure geological surveying. And what's happening right now? Major companies, they declare that they start reducing investment into geological surveillance. And this means that very soon we'll see a significant slump in production. And this means that oil will cost even more in the future. And what's happening with the demand? On this slide, you see the structure of oil consumption, 50%, almost 50%, that's cars. And let's talk about more about this industry. According to some assessments of analytical agencies, and for example, Navigant Research, we have more than 1 billion cars in the world. And by 2030, we are going to have 50% more cars. It will be more than 1.8 billion cars. But not all the cars are internal combustion engine cars. That's true. Electric cars, it's less than half percent such points. And according to the same agency, by 2030, we'll have um, 8 to 14 percent percent uh, cars, uh, which are electric cars. And despite that, the number of internal combustion engine cars will still be high by 2030. And it means that in the midterm, we will still need oil. Summing up, I'd like to once again answer the question that I uh, posed myself. So now the price of oil is the highest, and it doesn't look like we have the crisis in the oil industry, but oil companies are reducing investments, and this will eventually lead to the slump in production, and stable and growing demand will be pushing prices up. We will need oil in the future. There are some other arguments, energy shift, environmental agenda, and very often we see this picture. It's a very classic picture. New York, year 1900, and New York, year 1913. On the left, horses. On the right, no horses. Where are they? Only the cars. Same is going to happen with oil. But do you know what's the problem about this picture? In 1930, there were lots of cars, but it was not the representation of the whole world. It was just the trend. Uh, all other countries were still using horses. Eventually, we all moved to, uh, to cars. We probably won't need oil in a distant future, but what is going to happen? in 10 years. What's our plan B? What are we going to be uh, doing? So this is an important question we should answer at this um, venue of uh, Gaida Forum. I wish you good luck. Thank you very much for your attention. And right now we are going to talk to Nikita Knyazev, who is a super finalist of Leaders 2020. He is a market director for precious metals at the Moscow Exchange. Change. Let's continue talking about trends. Nikita, over to you. Larissa, good day. My name is Nikita. I'm responsible for precious metals at the Moscow Exchange. But I'd like to talk now about some other values. I'm 34, I have two kids, and recently my parents uh, retired. And I started thinking about my own pension. What do we see? Thanks to digitalization, uh, I use Gosuslugi website and I see that the overall average uh, pension is 16.5 thousand rubles. It's actually not bad. But what's happening if I continue working? Uh, so that's data for me, so it's electronic calculator. If you continue working for 20 more years, my pension will be 35 thousand rubles. But is it really? Uh, an ideal situation? No. I'd like to get something similar to what pensioners get in Switzerland, for example, 90,000 90, rubles. But what do they do in the West to get such a big pension? Let's uh, compare uh, the situation in Russia with an example uh, from the West. How much uh, savings do we need to have to 
have good life when you are pensioner. According to Fidelity, that's 10 annual um, incomes. That's why people have to start saving very early. How much do you need to save every year in order to support your uh, good standard of living after 65? You need to annually save not less than 15% of your own income. Where can we save? We can open a deposit, maybe. So what do people usually use in the developed countries, United States, UK, or Switzerland? Think Ahead Institute gives us the following statistics. Shares. That's actually the biggest share. In the UK, they more uh, invest into bonds. And it's important that in the stock exchange, people invest more than 50% of their savings. So there is really a host of questions still there. What kind of deals do you do? What are the investment strategies? What is the optimal structure of investments? How can you choose a mediator, a broker, or a managing company who is better? How to define who are fraudsters and who are not? And the main question. What do you need to do if you want to invest correctly? Is the situation really widespread? What do we see? Lots of people start investing now. More than 15 million people are entered the account at the stock exchange. So there are lots of um, broker accounts opened in Russia. But how much money is there? According to the Bank of Russia research, 60% of accounts are empty. It means that people took the decision to open something apart from bank deposits, but they didn't invest any money into these accounts. And one quarter of these accounts, it's, ma it's account for up to 1,000 rubles. It means that mm, that's normal people opening these accounts. And uh, if this dynamic dynamics is maintained, it's 6 trillion rubles. And year on year, this investment grows by 50% annually. If you compare this with deposits, deposits, they simply capitalize your interest. But investments, uh, if you open a broker account, that's a different story. Uh, we had, there were six IPOs at the Moscow Exchange, and you see here figures of what was invested into the real economy. Capitalization versus GDP was much more than 50%. It's 55%. And who are these investors? Of bringing in this money. According to the Bank of Russia, investors look like that. 35 to 50 years old, married with kids, higher education. So that like you, it's like you and me. So they're trying to find something uh, more profitable than the deposit. How do they get information uh, from social networks, messengers such as Telegram? What are the goals? Loan, term investments, pension, additional income. What's the first purchase usually? Russian shares through the mobile app. Because it's now easy to do. Um, passive investment strategy, I buy and I hold uh, the shares. Interesting facts, but uh, let's see how the investors take these decisions and what do they know about investment safety? What are the basics? 51% of people never learned about anything, uh, anything about investments. More than 20% don't know that there is a risk of losing money. 19% buy investment products and they don't understand how they work. And in 2021, we see the following picture. Uh, Telegram channels become more influential. That's why we have lots of novices in investments. And we've seen lots of um, problems because uh, there is very there are very high prices for low liquidity shares so some of the telegram channels they said the fair value of a certain share is much higher and there were like um, 10 posts about uh, this certain share and just in the matter of days 
a huge amount of the shares were bought. And then, in two, three days, after the announcement from the company, it was about the lack of any events, uh, the price corrected uh, downwards. Of course, that's huge risks for investments, especially for novice investors. But what's happening with foreign uh, shares, those which are available for buying to the <coughs> common investors? So there are some risks as well. For example, Tal Education Group shares. After the regulator in China said that it's a good idea to, it's not a good idea to invest into education, the price of the shares dropped by 90%. So, what's the problem that we have? Low level of investment literacy, and this creates risks for losing all the savings uh, for people who are uh, thinking about their pensions. What do we need to do? We need to continue educating people. We need to educate people, tell them how to take decisions. They need to understand risks. They need to understand how the investment products work. And uh, for this, we created the investment literacy program. That's uh, the course for investors with experience of not more than a year. It has all the basic information. It was uh, prepared on the basis of international recommendations. And amateur investors will know what the investment tools are, how to protect your risks, and what rights you have. Now, more than 1 million people started this course, and more than 180,000 people um, graduated from this course. I think that this course will make our economy more stable, will have less barriers, and the uh, businesses will become more profitable. And as a result, we'll see comfortable pension level for lots of people. I advise you to invest into the future and start the course uh, which I was talking about. Diana uh, Gazatulina also knows what can help our economy to grow in the future, and she is uh, here with us online. Diana? Diana? Please switch on your mic. We can see you. And we can hear you. Wonderful. A very good evening to everyone during today and tomorrow. The experts of the Guider Forum are going to discuss the trends that are reigning globally. The question is, uh, which country is going to be the most successful today? We're going to listen to a lot of opinions on that matter, and uh, I also have an opinion on that, and I think that uh, the most successful countries will be those where the population is uh, very educated. Educated education, indeed, boost the economic growth. If we increase uh, the level of education by 10 percent, uh, will result in 10% economic growth. The more educated the population of the country is, the better is the country's GDP. But today we are not uh, talking about uh, the education that uh, we are used to, for example, when we finish the high school and uh, uh, go to the university and then use uh, this degree throughout our life. This approach has been replaced by the lifelong learning, and uh, actually it is completely in line with my mindset. When I'm setting uh, for myself new managerial tasks, I always improve my professional competences. Uh, when I needed, for example, knowledge uh, on human resources, I decided to go to um, Princeton University, and uh, when I had to go for GR, I decided to take up an educational program on that. And uh, even now, speak, speaking in public, I decided to improve my public sk speaking skills. Um, thus, I think that uh, any kind of performance requires uh, professional skills that have to be honed. Investments into increasing employees' qualification can 
improve uh, the global GDP by $6.5 billion very shortly. Today, in fact, uh, we have two main trends in professional enhancement. It is risk skilling and uh, upskilling. In the second case, you develop existing employees' skills. The quality of management is directly dependent on the quality of skills. That is why I'm talking about that a lot. There are industrial cases of upskilling and reskilling. For example, last year, the digitalization ministry of the Russian Federation launched a new project, digital trades, and there any citizen of the Russian Federation can buy a digital educational program for 50% of price. All the digital companies, uh, in fact, uh, put a stake on reskilling and upskilling, investing billions of dollars into their employees. For example, Amazon launched an upskilling 2025 program, and they also opened a machine learning university. Same Amazon, according to Gartner, uh, study shows that. Uh, Mm -hmm. The companies that invested into their talents showed better results comparing to the companies that uh, either kept these investments uh, at a low level or didn't invest into employees at all. The pandemic spurred uh, digitalization. So what do we have today? Corporate universities are blossoming everywhere. There are lots of corporate educational programs, and what's important is that uh, today, in fact, many of those educational programs offered by corporations, they do not share their terms and glossaries. No matter how many courses, uh, in fact, uh, you have taken, it's important how you apply the knowledge you've gained uh, um, and how you've managed to improve KPIs of your companies, uh, the efficiency of your company, and uh, fulfilling your tasks. One of the main points of development is providing education to the top management. We have lots of educational programs offered to the top management, but mostly they are focused at uh, improving soft skills. Such skills as, for example, public speaking or building team relationships or learning how to control your time. However, considering the digitalization that I've already mentioned, it's important to, to improve your hard skills as well. It's important to, to learn digital transformation, for example. And thus, every manager has to understand how to understand digital data, how to read dashboards, how to communicate with the code developers, and how to understand the IT sphere in your company in general. And in fact, here we are coming up to the notion of multi-format education. That's a type of education when, where you are not only developing new skills, but at the same time you are improving your cultural experience, you are improving your public speaking skills, and you are going for sport, for example. It's important to understand uh, the relevant agenda. We are, we've mentioned uh, already today that we are living in the WUCA world. We have to implement this culture into your day-to-day -day operations and uh, into all of your activities. I, I could be talking about that uh, for a really long time, but coming back to continuous education, I need to mention that those who are going for continuous education, they will become the future trend makers and they will be able to adapt uh, to the continuously changing agenda and they will be able to really influence that GDP. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to continue this discussion. Thank you, Dina. We'll follow up on the scientific team with Pavel Voligov, head of science department from Perm National Research Polytechnic University. He's the director of Prioritat program in this university. He's an expert in science, science metric analysis and scientific organization management. 
Pavel, over to you. Larissa, colleagues, good afternoon. Today, I would like to talk about uh, the future technological development of our country. Let's talk about uh, the particularities and trends of this development and, based importantly, about uh, the challenges that Russia is facing. We are very rightly proud of the Russian science, the achievements of our scientists, constructors, our achievements in uh, space technologies, virology, immunology. But on the other hand, probably it's high time we assess the status of research and development sector of, of our country. Let's look at uh, our place on the global landscape and uh, think about the existing prog problems and uh, solutions that we could come up with. Today, Russia accounts only for 3% of scientific publications in the leading reviews of the world. Our country is uh, not in the top 20 countries uh, that owns patents for useful models and inventions. Russia is the only country out of developed countries where the volume of research activities is going down year on year. Experts are talking about two stable trends. The first one is about the increasing complexity of scientific and technological ta tasks, and that is why scientific competence becomes less and less elitist and more and more mass. That is why we need more and more researchers in our economy. The second trend tells us that uh, resources are being concentrated around the leaders, and that is how uh, peripheral countries uh, are losing their resources. Objectively, Russia is not one of uh, the research and development centers uh, across the globe, except for space technologies, maybe. And unfortunately, Russia loses its positions on the R&D market, and uh, that threatens uh, us losing our resources and status. So how should we develop uh, the potential and technologies in our country in order not to become a third world company? country? Today, we mostly follow the corporate logics of development, uh, just copying the, the Soviet industrial management system. That leads us nowhere. The corporate model is uh, losing its position across the world. It is not capable of coping up with the agenda and uh, the new model of distribution labor inside the corporation. Following the cargo cult, Russia tried to copy the European R&D clusters development uh, model and uh, they are relying on resources uh, and ideas being located very close one to another geographically. In Russia, it is not so. We have a huge distance uh, separating even Moscow and St. Petersburg, and thus we are not able to provide the same distribution. That can lead to uh, Russian science dying in the region, and then we will, be, we will have to come up with the new type of scientific cities. Have we lost all the hope? Well, hopefully not. In fact, new models of R&D give Russia a beautiful opportunity of offering their own model of development that could consider the particularity and features of our territory, our distribution of intellectual resources, and in fact, we could make this model of development a new global standard. I think that we should rely on network, on the network model a flexible model, polycentric model, based on the correct distribution of resources. In order to implement this model, we need to follow the key principles, such as openness, for example. We need to be the we, we need to be uh, the supporter of uh, the principle of openness. Uh, we need to support scientists across the world. Then Russia has a unique complex of R&D infrastructure. We need to make it accessible for researchers and constructors across the world. 
from all those points. Then we need to develop communication. We need to support open cooperation and communication between scientists and researchers, removing all the obstacles for their communication. And of course, we need to provide economic freedoms in the invention and uh, new design centers. And finally, only with the implementation of uh, the partnership principle in terms of carrying out R&D work and the distribution of revenues, only providing that we can create a fair environment, establishing a good foundation for further collaboration. There are examples of uh, good implementation of such a concept. Take financial technologies or biotechnologies, for example. Today we see how Russian inventions and new technologies indeed set new global standards. At the local level, we also have uh, measures of how we can implement these concepts. Taking, working on the university development projects in Perm, Polytechnic University, we based our work on this model. We foster discussion and uh, we foster the shared use of R&D activity results. That already brought very good results. We came up with new models for hydrogen and engines and other types of engines. We are working with the new innovative materials. One great man said that uh, if we exchange apples, we'll still have apples. But if we exchange ideas, all of us will have all the ideas and we will keep them. Launching 2030 program, in fact, uh, we started implementing the principles I've just outlined. I think it's courageous. I think it's it means taking up the responsibility for changes in the area of science in our country. Of course, this program has to be further fine-tuned, but uh, the mere launch of this program gives us good hope for a bright future. And we will believe that it'll come. And we believe that it'll come. Thank you very much. And now from Perm, we are going to Kursk. We've been listening to leaders, and now it's over to a female leader, Maria Nosova, PhD in economics, director of competence center in the agro-industrial complex in Kursk region. Good day. Today, I want to talk about female leadership. Now we're living in a world uh, in a time of changes, and there are lots of challenges that let women to show what they're capable of. Now we have the need for new, more soft way of leadership. We have more and more women who are leaders. Do you know that every fifth company in Russia is headed by a woman. Uh, Deloitte made a research and published the results. And according to this research, uh, uh, the majority of women who are CEOs, they work in education, healthcare, finance, uh, retail. Leaders uh, of the countries who are women, they were more active in fighting pandemic uh, of COVID-2019. This was stated by Christine Lagarde, the head of the uh, European Central Bank. In her statement, she said that uh, Rush, uh, women uh, who are politicians are use simpler language when talking to their constituencies. Now I'd like to talk about the definition of a woman who is a leader. What are her main competences? First of all, it's a woman who inspires. She can motivate. She's flexible. She can hear opinions of others. She will build a team around her. She's not domineering. She turns her team into a family. According to SG 
agenda and sustainable development goals, we understand that now it's very important for women to be proactive. It's important for them to build up uh, proactive teams around them and be always open for cooperation. But that's just the theory. And what can I say about the practice? I'd like to tell you about the about the woman, a day of a woman who is a leader. That's me. Five kilometers run in the morning, seven in the morning. Then I'm an expert in the agricultural sector. I meet farmers on a regular basis. I also am a professor at the university. I have a very busy schedule, but I'm also a mom and a wife. I have some responsibilities at home. I have to help my children with lessons. I have to prepare my child uh, for the presentation tomorrow. And I also need to visit the school when she has uh, her performance. And then uh, when I was preparing for this speaking at a forum, it was 12 o'clock a.m., my younger daughter came in and she had, uh, mom, I have a temperature. Sometimes I feel that I'm a superwoman because I have to do so much. But I'm happy that right now it's okay, I can study uh, on a constant basis. Last year, I graduated from the female leadership uh, program uh, started by Valentina Matvienko. And thanks to this platform, Russia, the country of opportunities, and Senish program headed by Maria Fonina, more than 100 women were learning how to use soft power, how to balance career, creativity, and family. As a result, we got uh, certificates and 25 social programs were started. Now they're being implemented in different regions of our country. All these projects were presented at the third Eurasian Female Forum in St. Petersburg in October 2021. There were women from 111 countries of the world. Despite the pandemic, they came to St. Petersburg. Uh, they wanted to talk about very important, very topical issues uh, that are important for women. And uh, they were very ready for mutual support. They were ready for cooperation. President Vladimir Putin visited the forum. He had a welcoming address for the in front of these female leaders. And he also said that in our times, a woman shouldn't be shouldn't be able to choosing career, children, family. And in Russia, there are lots of conditions for women who give birth to their children uh, to continue their careers. And I'm very happy that there are lots of women now who want to create communities. They want to be beautiful, and uh, they want, at the same time they can implement very important social projects. So women could be politicians, could be leaders, could be managers, and it's great that we can share our experience with uh, younger girls so that they grow more active. I had great examples of my mom and my grandmother. I look like them. They are very beautiful women. They taught me a lot. And my main mission is to teach Anya, my daughter, everything I know. She is going to turn three uh, in a, a week. She can do a lot of things. She's very ambitious. She has some capacities of a leader. And I'm absolutely sure that if I hold her by the hand and help her always, in the future she'll achieve a lot of things the same like me. And I wish you love, peace, and harmony. Thank you very much. And what can we say about leaders who are men? How are they surviving in these difficult times? Vlad Dimir Vlasov, chairman of the association ANPK, uh, Aramil Scientific and Production Cluster. Uh, for many, many years, he was um, the managing the production, and his, he has great experience, and he's going to share it with us. I am happy to welcome everyone. I wanted to share my experience, giving you the uh, business case of my company. 
how we survived during the pandemic. So we are talking about leaders today. So I want to tell a couple of words about myself, my background. I uh, went down the journey, which I'm proud of. I am an industrial specialist. And why is that? I went to the production uh, line when I was a school child. I was going to different extracurriculum activities, for example, modeling, uh, working with fur, and many, many hours, carpenter and so on. I was, uh, there were many children in our family, and I had to go to the college. I wanted to go to college myself to start earning my own money. I went to Ural Mash uh, factory to work, and I got to know some mentors and teachers who share the experience with me. First of all, that experience of working with people. It was very curious for me to know how these huge factories operate and how so many people interact with each other. I was looking at interaction between workers and their managers. When I organized my own company, I used all the skills. They were very useful for me. My first experience of, set, of uh, managing my own company started 15 years ago. The company that I manage right now produces uh, oil and gas equipment. I remember this difficult period when I was setting up the company. I was 30 years old, and what I was doing was extremely important for me. So we work with clients, uh, those which are oil and gas uh, production companies. And at that time, they are going through very uh, difficult times. So I worked with one of the majors uh, in oil and gas. I do have this striking memory uh, beginning of uh, 2020 when we had lockdown announced all my heads of production were uh, gathered in my room the head of the HR told me uh, what other companies are doing they sent people to vacation uh, fire they fire people so they were doing everything to minimize costs so the team uh, were feeling panicky uh, due to uh, specifics uh, of our activity, we realized that we can't stop operations. Everyone was saying, how can we survive? Then I told them that we shouldn't just survive, we should develop. There is no other way. And we didn't want this to be just a phrase. I said it was never easy. That's the type of, uh, of the job we do. We have to develop in very difficult conditions when it's sometimes difficult to survive or even live. So for me, survival, that's just uh, plucking uh, the holes and if you develop, this will help you to achieve stability. If you develop, you constantly achieve transformation and changes. And we need to ensure smooth transformation, preparing the foundation for the next step forward. We need to start uh, with teaching uh, human resources. And uh, after some time, after the beginning of lockdown, we increased our production, we widened the line of products, we increased the number of personnel, we bought new equipment, we do not have any loans. Yes, there is a lot to be done in the future, but I'm absolutely sure that we have a bright future ahead of us. We made correct um, decisions, and all the team uh, I'm working with. We have very clear understanding of what areas we are going to develop. We need to ensure digitalization. We need to change the mindset of people. That's the most difficult thing. We need to implement automation process, autom automated processes, those which will unite all the logistics, financial, and production functions. Secondly, we need to have good leaders, those who will teach their subordinates and will explain what's automation, what's digitalization. We need leaders who are aimed at transformation, and uh, their subordinates uh, will be going after that. And the third thing, we need to have good people, simple workers. We need 
good people. We shouldn't be afraid to teach young specialists uh, in fears that they will leave the company. No, we need to know how to motivate them. Resources should be spent on the team, on teaching and training. I think that if you work with people, it's always the correct direction. I wish everyone health, and I'm always open for cooperation. Thank you for your attention. Vladimir, thank you very much. And now we are going to talk to Novosibirsk. Uh, Valentina Dudnikova, first deputy head of administration, head of the Department of Management Organization and State Civil Service of the governor of the Novosibirsk. So this is our first pre last presentation, and she's going to talk about the journey of a leader. There were very interesting opinions uh, voiced, and now I'd like to talk about uh, some a summary, give you some summary. So if you are a leader, you are formed from the school age. Some people become leaders just accidentally. They try, they like it, and then continue uh, being a leader. There is an opinion that in the civil, if you're a civil official, you can't become a personality. You'll be just a cog um, in the mechanism. You will not be independent. You won't be able to do something important. You won't be able to develop yourself. I would say that's an absolutely outdated stereotype. Everything has changed. Uh, we work in the situation of many factors, of uh, interaction of different sectors, and uh, our work, that's a mirror of reality. The reality is multifaceted and very challenging. So there are different people who have different facets of their character, and we need people with different individualities. And that's why uh, we need those people who are really great personalities, those who can work in the multitasking regime, who can adapt to changes, and those who will be focused on long-term goals. Now, if you are civil efficient, you can develop different talents, and everything depends on you. For me, civil service uh, helped to become a leader. I was managing this municipality, and I got a great insights about interaction with people. Yeah, we can talk about soft power or hard power, different styles of management, but if you never took managerial decisions, if you never spoke with people uh, in small villages where there are 100 or 200 people living, if you never was taking difficult decisions, you can't talk about um, municipalities management. And I think it's something that helps us to be a practical person and solve difficult issues. I remember that uh, we had uh, very heated debates when we were coming up with the resource center as uh, civil initiatives. In fact, the population was uh, receiving that in a negative way because people were simply worried. They were worried that uh, they will lose uh, their uh, the environment that they were used to. But now they see that these changes were for the better. Now we have uh, different uh, development center, the center, centers of the territorial management and other development centers. And in fact, those centers attract more and more civil initiatives. And in fact, they breed leaders for local communities. One month ago, we had an interesting event. And uh, quite unexpectedly, my colleagues uh, asked uh, an interesting and uh, surprising question, at least to me. They, uh, they asked, uh, what is a civil mindset? Because we are talking about uh, civil officials, civil people. So I think that uh, that's a person taken with uh, his or her motivation that is aimed at achieving good things and benefits for the population. To me, personally, it was always very interesting to understand what's happening around me. Uh, it is not only about you know improving your skills. I tried to, of course, improve my competences uh, in terms of my practice and uh, through teaching others um, my knowledge of uh, different the areas of uh, the legislation helped me to improve my analytical skills, and I uh, also improved my skills that uh, 
helped me to improve the management and governance system on the regional and municipal level. And uh, of course, in this environment, uh, you are a creator because you are creating the future that uh, everyone is striving for. I remember that back in 2005, in our team, we came up with the definition of a regional information system and an information resource. Because at the time, it was indeed a real novel, a novelty. And then, working in terms of the legislative uh, authority, I improved my communication skill and skills and uh, I learned how to reach a compromise. Today I work at uh, the top tier of, uh, of uh, the regional management authority. I can implement projects from taking the first decision up to the final implementation of the project and uh, uh, indeed uh, I'm very passionate. I'm uh, uh, infected with uh, what I do. I put all my heart into the improvement of my team. We are continuously looking for answers to all the questions of what to do, how to do it, and why should we take it up at all. And I think that uh, we've managed to bring to life many changes, change uh, approaches and procedures, and sometimes you think, what can you change, in fact, in terms of uh, the human resources system? But uh, over less than two years, we created a system for regional authorities that are completely aligned with the best global practices, and that uh, is in essence, not formally. Sometimes we say that uh, being in service, it's like denying yourself. I think that uh, that's one of the extremes. To me, serving your country is uh, a very aware and uh, mindful attitude to your country. You can continue being open to everything new, but not just copying those new things, but transforming and adapting those decisions. Without being aware, you cannot be a leader. You cannot come up with the new ideas and uh, take up the responsibility. And uh, today, colleagues uh, were mentioning that already. Of course, uh, in the world, uh, we witness many intense changes. The changes are objective and subjective, and uh, the micro world and micro reality of one person can influence the macro reality of the world around him or her. It's important to understand the direction of all those changes, and it's important to take up a positive mindset, a positive attitude. It's important to find resources from within yourself, and it's important to lead people after you. That's uh, one of the leader's objectives. We show new horizons, we change stereotypes, we are not destroying anything, but we are changing ourselves and the world. Thank you very much, Valentina. Well, colleagues, that is it. These are the leaders that we wanted to introduce you to. That is how they think, that is how they reason, that is what they want. I thank everyone who, took, who was taking part in this session. I thank our audience. We are always open to you. Please ask uh, questions of our speakers. Pass them your wishes and your congratulations uh, on their successful talks. We um, will be in touch with you working on, on our project. Thank you.